Hi, sorry for that um, delay. <laughs> Technical problems in a tech conference, who would believe it? So, without further ado, we now have Stefan Fanuka, who would talk to us about enabling real time computing in OpenStack. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, so, yeah, talking about a real time presentation, and we're now running on time, so I'm going to speed through this uh, a little bit. Uh, Stop me if I happen to, there's a laser pointer at the end of this, so stop me if I happen to point the laser in somebody's eyes by mistake. So, um, a little bit of background. Uh, this is a pretty broad presentation that covers a good few technologies, so I'm going to give a quick run through of some of the technologies I'm going to be talking about here first, and then I'll move into like a, a deeper dive on um, this functionality, how this is implemented and how it works. So in case you haven't heard of it, um, OpenStack is a big deal. Um, it's a, an open source cloud computing system uh, made up of a load of little project, a uh, load of individual projects that focus on various aspects of a functioning cloud. So you have services for, for networking, you have services for compute, you have services for block storage and so forth. The thing I'm going to be talking about here today is Nova, which is the compute service. Uh, I'm an OpenStack Nova core developer, uh, basically one of the maintainers. Um, and most of my focus on OpenStack Nova is on enabling NFE functionality. So high performance compute, um, huge pages, uh, CPU pinning, that kind of thing, uh, which I'm going to go into here. OpenStack from a, a high level perspective, it tries to be as much of a cloud uh, as possible, so you should realistically never have to know anything about the underlying hardware capabilities of the cloud that you're running on. You're able to create servers, you're able to create networks, images, attach everything together. It's all nice and kind of like abstract and cloudy, um, and that's, that's what 90% of people are looking for. But the problem with this kind of cloud abstractions and that is when you talk, get down into the nitty gritty of the, the kind of features that um, telco users or scientific users are looking for, those cloud abstractions tend to hamper your, your performance um, and that's not something that you want. It basically means OpenStack isn't useful for your use cases. So we've been working on kind of fixing a few of these issues for, I'd say, since before the Juno release, which was three or four years ago. So we've implemented a couple of, uh, a couple of features during that time to kind of close this performance gap with like normal bare metal. So things like um, allowing you to attach SRIOV devices to instances, allowing you to pin the CPUs of your instances to host cores, um, huge pages, New, like representing your, your, hop, or your guest's apology in like a NUMA aware fashion. And then the last two releases we've worked on, uh, on two particular features, one of which I'm going to talk today, the real-time policy, and then another one which I'm not really going to focus on, which is emulator phase policy. So for anyone that isn't aware what real-time is, real-time means that you're, um, if you have a real-time application, uh, and you're, you're guaranteed that uh, that will meet certain timing constraints. So uh, if you're delivering messages over a network, that those messages will be delivered at a certain amount of time. Something will happen like uh, on a given repetition. It doesn't mean that it's fast or anything. It just means that it's consistent. And this is important from, again, the, the telco perspective because if you're talking about uh, sending voice packets or something over your network, you need to make sure that they actually get where they're supposed to be getting. So uh, there's a couple of prerequisites for what I'm going to be talking about here. The first of these is that you, you need suitable hardware. This is, a bit of, um, this is a bit of a tricky area because if you go on to like the real-time Linux kernel wikis and stuff, they'll list hardware and they'll say, well, we tested on this hardware and the performance wasn't that great and it was better on this particular chip than this chip. And they very rarely give a reason for why it's better. There's just something in the under underlying architecture of those chips uh, that makes it better for real-time use cases. Uh, 
all the testing that I did on here was on a standard like Intel Xeon based micro, uh, micro semi server or something. There we go. Obviously, you're going to need OpenStack Pike on Ura because, as mentioned before, uh, this functionality wasn't available before Pike. Uh, you're going to need a ver recent enough version of LiveVert uh, because this all hooks down into LiveVert um, deep down. And then uh, you're going to need a kernel that has the, the real time preempt patches applied. So, CentOS packages this. You can get rail versions of this. I don't know about Ubuntu. Um, but I did all my testing for this on the CentOS 7.4. Uh, distro. From the host uh, configuration, the hardware level, uh, when you're benchmarking a the system, these sa same kind of things come up. You want to disable kind of like fancy features, so power management, uh, things like turbo boost and that. You want your, your, you don't want any magic going on in your hardware. You don't want it thrusting in the CPU because it decided that, oh, you know, you, we're going to save you a little bit of power. You want it running 100% 100 uh, 100 of the time. Uh, so basically disable, hyperthreading, power management, turbo roofs, that kind of thing. Uh, and then from the software perspective, the real-time kernel that I mentioned before, uh, the real-time KVM module, and uh, there's a utility called Tuned, which will configure like your Grub uh, kernel boot parameters for you. Uh, Tuned comes with profiles for for real time uh, that you can install through uh, repositories. And that will just pass through those, uh, those kernel boot, time pra uh, boot parameters. So uh, installing the kernels, installing, installing the tune profiles, uh, configuring those tune profiles, enabling huge pages. And then uh, this last option, does this work? No. This last option is um, an, a Nova specific thing which uh, lets you determine what cores on your system Nova is allowed to touch. When you're talking about real-time Linux, uh, you should usually leave a couple of cores for non-preemptible processes. So the, uh, the preempt patches make most things in the Linux kernel preemptible, but not everything. So the, uh, the general best practice is to get, leave a couple of cores that the, the scheduler can keep for itself. Um, so yeah, basically isolating a couple of cores from the um, from Nova. The guess what you're actually going to be running from your application perspective is entirely dependent on what you're trying to do. For the sake of testing, I just went and used the exact same configuration for my guest as I had on my host. So that meant that I was using um, the real-time kernel again, and uh, the tuned profile. Only this time, I went for the guest profile, which again is a bit like it's packaged and available. Uh, if you already have a real-time application, whether that's something that you've got from, like, you bought in an application from Ericsson or something, uh, a VNF, that kind of thing, then you should obviously use that. And again, install all those stuff, uh, enable the profile, enable huge pages. And then we actually finally get into the, uh, the, the OpenStack stuff. Um, OpenStack Nova has uh, two ways of configuring a guest. Uh, the first of those is via image properties. So when you create an image, you can set certain properties saying, I need this specific CPU feature for this image to work. Um, the other way is what they call flavors. So flavors dictate how much memory your, your VM is going to have, how much CPU is going to have, uh, that kind of thing. <coughs> it also allows you to use a thing called extra specs, which are like scheduler hints. So they'll say, I want CPU pinning, I want real time, I want real time to use these cores, this kind of thing. Uh, there's three things that we're going to want to configure here. The first of these is CPU policy, which dictates uh, whether your guest cores are pinned to the host or not. We're going to want them pinned. The second of these is whether you're enabling real time. Because it's a real time demo, obviously you're going to be enabling real time. And then the last of these is huge pages, um, which you'll usually want from a performance standpoint. You've also got the other two things, but again, I'm not going to talk about these today. So going back to that OpenStack, uh, the command line client, uh, we're creating a flavor. We've got four CPUs, four gigs of RAM, um, 20 gigs of disk space, and we're calling, we're giving it a name, RT1 small. And then we're going to set these uh, extra specs, which again are like scheduler hints. So there's four of these here. 
The first of these, the CPU policy, is the one that determines whether your guest cores are pinned or not. Dedicated means that we want our guest cores to be pinned to the host cores. So there'll be a one-to-one -one mapping between um, guest core processes and your host cores. The second of those, real-time, we want to enable the real-time and we also want to tell Nova that some of those cores shouldn't be marked as real-time cores. Again, because we're using the Linux kernel uh, for our guest here and we want uh, some of those cores to be non-real-time and uh, for scheduler processes. And then the last one is one gig huge pages. And then we create a server with this flavor and with some sample image that doesn't really matter. So the interesting uh, thing about how this works, this only works, Nova supports a couple of, um, a couple of uh, hypervisor drivers. This only works with uh, libvirt uh, KVM. So if you're using Zen or something, sorry, this, you're out of luck. Uh, so what's interesting to look at here is the, uh, the Libra XML <coughs> that Nova will generate for you and what that actually, how that reflects um, like deep down what kind of calls and stuff it's making to the host. So the first of these is the, uh, the CPU tune element. This will be, if you do like dump XML for your Libra domain, you'll get a big XML blob uh, with all the information about your, your guest in it. If we look at just the CPU tune one, uh, CPU tune, it's uh, an element that specifies which of your, your host physical CPUs that an AV CPU would be able to do. So that CPU pinning that I was talking about, this determines that for you. So there's uh, two important attributes to note here. The first of these is the vCPU pin one and the vCPU scheduler one. Uh, vCPU pin, how that works under the hood, it calls a, a Linux um, function, which is set affinity. Uh, if you look uh, at your, your QMU process and you look at the threads that QMU has spawned, it has an individual thread for every single one of your guest, uh, your guest cores. So each vCPU is basically a, a host process, a KVM process. And by uh, configuring this property, what we're saying is that the, the first vCPU in the instance, we want it pinned to um, core two on the host. We want the first uh, vCPU then to be pinned to the third core on the host and so forth. And it calls, libvirt calls uh, the set affinity function on that. And if we go and we look using the task set uh, command at the pinning information for these calls, we see that in fact they are actually uh, affined to host cores. And nothing else, if assuming you have your host configured correctly, nothing else should be running on these, which means that you're getting essentially 100% of your performance um, for each of your guest cores. The other one then uh, is the vCPU scheduler uh, attribute. So this is again another optional element and what this determines is the scheduler type that your CPU threads are going to be using. Under normal circumstances this will just use the standard scheduling process that your, whatever your host is using. Naturally we don't want that. Uh, what we want is um, we want FIFO or what are the real-time uh, priorities to be applied. How that works under the hood is again another kernel function. This time the previous one was set affinity, this is set scheduler and as the name suggests uh, you pass in a process ID uh, and you tell it what scheduler policy you want to be applying to that process ID and various magic will happen and that will get applied. And for this, to validate this, we have a CHRT application. Uh, you pass in a process ID to this and it'll give you the scheduling policy that's in order and the scheduling priority. The priority is a value from 0 to 99 and that determines uh, if you've got two things in their conflict and which of those will take priority over the other process, naturally enough. The interesting thing to note here, the first two cores that we had uh, were using, like I said, 
we had told we'd mass those because we didn't want every core in our guests to be running with a real-time policy because the kernel isn't necessarily guaranteed to work that way. So they're using the standard other um, policy for this. And then the other two cores, which is where if we were running an application, this is the cores, the guest cores that we would actually run our application on, they are scheduled with the, uh, the FIFO policy. We also talked about uh, huge pages. As far as that's implemented, there's a memory back in attribute. Uh, you say what page, we configure what page size we wanted. We, and then there's some other stuff in there that doesn't really matter. Nova does all of this for you. And if we go and we look at, again, the QMU process, we get the process ID for that, and we look through the, um, through the huge page mapping for each of those processes. Uh, we'll see that it is actually indeed mapped to the QMU process as we'd expect. If we, because we created the server, if we go and log into that server then, you can use an application called Cyclic Test, which will evaluate the real-time readiness of your system. That should, that will give you a measurement of your latencies. From what I've been told, you want, you want to be looking for something in the below 20 mic microseconds, I think, uh, of latency. On average, anything below 20, you're usually pretty good. You wouldn't expect this to ever hit zero for um, using the real-time preempt patches uh, in the kernel. You might, if you had your own real-time application, a VNF or something from a telco, but for the kernel patches, you're not going to see that kind of thing. So yeah, a wrap up. From a usability perspective, today if you go and you install OpenStack, you configure your host correctly and you're using a recent release, you create your flavor, you set your various flavor attributes, and then you boot your instance and you now have real-time compute within your cloud, wherever that may be. So yeah, that's keeping it real-time. Thanks for listening. Uh, If anyone has any questions, shout. Can you say that again? If I heard you correctly, you're saying if you boot multiple instances and they're pinned, they'll use the same host, they'll be pinned to the same host CPUs. Uh, do we do anything to prevent that from happening? We use... Yes, yeah, so from Nova perspective, um, the recommendation that we have is if you have pinned instances and non-pinned instances, the non-pinned instances aren't aware of the pinning information, then they'll just stomp all over your, the cores. They'll float across cores and they'll use anything that they can. Uh, the recommendation we have for that is to use a, a, a Nova feature called host aggregates, where you divide, you eventually, essentially divide your cloud into multiple parts and you're saying, this part of my cloud, i.e. these servers, are allowed to run real-time processes or pin processes. These ones are allowed to use non-pinned processes, and that just stops them from overlapping. For if you have two pinned processes, Nova will make sure that the two servers won't overlap. There'll be no overlap, so um, you'll give four cores or whatever to one server, and then if you give four to another guest, there'll be four different cores, and if it's not able to do that, it'll fail to schedule. So it'll make sure that we don't overlap. That doesn't happen. So the question was, uh, what are the drawbacks, if you have CPU pinning already, what are the drawbacks of adding real-time to that? 
So the, I know that there are performance impacts of using uh, real-time within the, the kernel. Real-time, I think I said that at the beginning, real-time doesn't necessarily mean faster. It just means it's more deterministic. So the general recommendation would be you use real-time if your application requires real-time, knowing that it is going to require more resources or you're going to get less throughput. If you don't require that real-time, you shouldn't... Yeah, you, you shouldn't need it because uh, you're better off use, increasing your resource utilization if possible. So, uh, the benchmark, is this one the guest? Yes. Did you stress on the host or the other guest as well? So, the question was um, in the benchmarks, did I stress, I stress the guest, did I also stress the host and other guests, did you say? Yeah. Um, so, as part of Part of the deployment process for this, the expectation is that you would stress the host first to make sure that the host is actually configured. Um, so there, there's a real-time evaluation tool, uh, RTE Val, which you're supposed to use to make sure that it is configured correctly. Uh, and then you use something like cyclic test to make sure that your latency is, is what you'd expect. Yeah, so that was done before anything else was deployed on top, just to make sure that the, the host kernel was configured. Right. Yep. So the question was, did you at the same time when you stressed at the guest, did you make the test? I did not. No, I didn't. <laughs> no, they were separate processes. They would, um, that would actually be a nice test to do. Because theoretically, uh, there should be no impact. Theoretically. Theoretically, yeah. But I imagine there probably would be some impact. You'd be trying to keep as, as much logic. Even the way that I deployed this, I used... Um, uh, this still isn't supported in triple O, like Red Hat's uh, deployment tool, so I was using DevStack for this, and it was a, an all-in-one deployment, so I had like Neutron and stuff running on that, that compute node. I shouldn't have had any of that there. Um, they were all isolated, but I, realistically I should only have had the compute service running on that, and everything else should be on a different machine. It would be a real, uh, that's actually something I'll probably go and do when I get home. I, I did. Uh, question, did I try running two things? I did, but I didn't benchmark it. It was only just to make sure that it did work and there was no funky stuff going on. So the question was, if the VM is pinned uh, to one CPU, is it possible to live migrate to a different host? No. Yeah, yeah, sort of. Um, this is a long-standing bug with Nova. We don't provide, as part of a live, so a live migration for anyone that's not aware means that your instance is running and you move it onto a different host and the instance stays running with minimal downtime, like microseconds. It's usually a little more than that, but uh, almost no noticeable downtime. The problem with uh, how we do live migrations is we don't pass sufficient information as part of the live migration request uh, to recalculate uh, the CPU map pinning info mapping on the destination side. So what ends up happening is that you use the exact same cores that you're using on the source on the host. We don't regenerate that, which means if you already had an instance running there and the cores were, be you were using cores 5 to 10, and this use cores three to seven, then there would be the two or three core overlap. Yeah, so it's a long-standing bug, and the, the reason it probably hasn't been fixed is because the fix is really, really difficult. So, sorry, in that case, the scheduler of Nova doesn't select proper compute host, so it doesn't analyze the CPU utilization of all target compute host in order to find the good one. It, so the, you're saying that um, the, the scheduler isn't properly evaluating the, the destination. It kind of, it, it's a dumb, like how it's doing it is a little bit daft. All it's looking at is, do I have enough free CPUs? And it will attempt to find the pinning information. And if you have enough free CPUs, it's not a scheduler issue per se. So you, you will have enough free CPUs and it's able to do the appropriate mapping. But when it actually gets there, it doesn't recalculate that. So it's more, it's not the conductor. I can't think of the name of the actual specific service that would do that. 
but it's, um, it's only in fact that we should be regenerating this XML and we don't. It's a long-standing bug and it's annoying, but uh, the recommendation usually is like, don't live migrate instances with pinning. And realistically, if you have CPU pinning on and you're talk worried about determinism and that, you m probably don't want to be live migrating in most cases. Uh, it is a bit of a niche use case. Any other questions? I think we're good. Thanks, guys.